hand over to Jim and John. Thank you. Okay, we're going to, we're going to talk about sound system intelligibility because although we tend to think of intelligibility as mainly speech, it also applies to musical instruments, anything that, where you want to hear subtlety. I'm just going to run through some stuff to do with intelligibility and how we measure it, and then uh, more to do with installation. You wouldn't normally do this on a, on a tour, but then kind of hand over to John. John's going to talk about more uh, things that lead on from some of the stuff I talk about, which is to do with um, um, actual sound systems in a touring-type situation where you're in a venue uh, may not be necessarily designed for acoustical production and uh, you're having to make quick decisions and decide you know, what to do in that venue and the kind of control that you can have or not have depending on the system you've got. Um, so if we look at a typical venue, um, we've got the direct sound coming from the, either the loudspeaker or the performer. Uh, in this case, the red line bang from the gunshot. And then you've got all sorts of reflected sound paths uh, in the room which come back to the, um, to the listener or the microphone in this case, um, either as discrete echoes or if there's enough of them and they're random enough, they come back as diffuse reverb. Um, if you're lucky enough to have some sound absorption in the room that's controlled, and when I say controlled, I mean some of it would be absorption, some of it might be diffusion, um, then hopefully there's some kind of acoustical design um, in the room that allow the room to be neither too dead nor too live or uh, give you good speech intelligibility but without necessarily killing all the nice reverb tail that you might be looking for. And um, that's some, some kind of mid-band sound absorption coefficients that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and I know that John will probably talk about situations where he's been, uh, where there's absolutely no sound absorption at all. I mean, one of those places where I've been is like um, King's Hall in Belfast, which is just a huge concrete barn, or it was when I was there. Um, but normally you're lucky enough to have some absorption in the room, even if it's only audience, and that will tend to cause the reverberation time to reduce slightly. The other thing that tends to reduce high-frequency reverberation times, uh, reverberation, is air absorption. And most of us, particularly in a domestic environment, don't really think about air absorption because it's... Um, it tends to be more obvious in terms of high frequency losses in reverberant fields, and it tends to be more obvious outdoors when we're trying to throw sound over a very long distance. Um, but if you remember that sound travels approximately 340 meters per second, if you're in a room that's got even like a two second reverb time, then you're up to uh, 680 um, meters of sound path uh, by the time the the minus 60 point is reached. Um, so most of the high frequency uh, will have got absorbed quite substantially by then. Um, and if you look at the absorption coefficient there, this is just at one temperature, it does vary a little bit with temperature, then you see that the, the worst case relative humidity at typical room temperatures around about 20%, which can absorb 10K in the region of um, about 30 dBs per 100 meters. So it's not surprising that most of the reverberation that comes back from a big space, uh, particularly if it's got air conditioning, it's dry air, um, is mainly kind of low mids and mid range, not too much high frequency stuff, unless it's a relatively small room with really hard surfaces. Um, just to show a quick figure really, this is not really a math lesson, it's just really to show the uh, factors that affect the reverberation time. Um, it really depends on the room volume. The total absorbency in the room, in other words, the number of square meters of absorption there are in the room, and also the air absorption, which is shown by the, the M there. Um, so it's a kind of factor of all those things. You can be in a fairly small room that's very, very live, um, that sounds very live, but has a relatively short reverb time. I was in a church building in Oslo last week, which is a, a kind of what we would normally term as a Victorian-style church with plastered walls. Not very big, probably about two or 300 people um, there. And it was very, very live. You're really aware of the 
reverberation in the room, uh, but the reverberation collapsed very quickly because it was a small volume. So, um, so the reverb time um, in a cathedral might be 11 seconds, but in a lot of the smaller churches, although they're very, very live, could only be two or three seconds. So it depends very largely on the volume of the room as well and how much of that wall surface is uh, absorbent. Um, there's also a, a pretty big difference in the way rooms behave between low frequencies and, and mid and high frequencies. So we tend to think of reverberation, um, uh, but we quite often forget that most rooms are very resonant uh, at low frequencies. Uh, the effects of the room is m dominated by uh, resonances between walls, um, front and back, side to side, floor to ceiling, and combinations of all those. Um, and there's a kind of formula that can be used um, that was devised by Schroeder uh, for a kind of... It's not really... It's fairly arbitrary, um, but it's where the room modes start to take over the, the reverb uh, at a low frequency. That's the most popular calculation. Um, but even in my working time in audio, that's changed from 1,000 to 2,000, so it's a fairly arbitrary measure. There's a kind of crossover between where the room is resonant and where the room is, has diffuse reverb characteristics. Um, and any of you that have ever tried to time or phase align uh, low frequency systems will know that it gets quite difficult in rooms, and sometimes it's more difficult in small rooms than it is in large rooms. Um, it's, I'd much rather uh, set up a, a time align, a subwoofer system on a festival that I could do in a few minutes compared with, say, trying to do the same thing in a West End theatre, which might take an hour over a lot of head scratching. Um, if we look at source directivity, that has a big effect on what we hear. The more directional the source, the, more, the greater the directivity it has, um, the more we hear the direct sound compared with the, the reverberant characteristics. And this is a kind of simple way of looking at directivity, the kind of Q factor, where if you have um, a, an omnidirectional loudspeaker kind of hanging in the middle of space, in free space, if you like, then it's got a Q of one. And every time you halve that space, halve that spherical radiation, in this case, to a hemisphere, if it's on the floor, then it doubles the directivity. If you put it between a floor and a wall, it quadruples the directivity. And if you put it in a, seal, uh, in a corner between the floor and the side walls, um, it will give you eight times the directivity. So that's one way of looking at directivity. Another way is to look at directivity index, and that's normally quoted in dBs. And it's quoted in dBs with respect to the on-axis position. And that's quite important because... Um, you can have a highly directional loudspeaker system, but if you're unlucky enough to be sitting off axis, um, then you know, even if you're within the manufacturer's coverage pattern of the loudspeaker, um, you could be 6 dB down off to the side, which means that your direct-to-reverb ratio has decreased 6 dB before you've even started doing anything else. Um, one of the things that's going to come up later on is talking about um, multiple... Um, horn systems as a way of keeping the directivity high for all listeners. Um, the current kind of state of the art at the moment um, is that a lot of installations are put in with very small loudspeakers with very little directivity um, in the low mid ranges. Um, and what's worse is there will only be typically one array, array aside uh, with just one line array or column aside which will just have one on-axis position aside, and everybody else off to the side is going to be in decreasing directivity index. Um, so there's something to be said um, with the older way of doing things, uh, which is to have uh, the old rule of thumb used to be that wherever you're sitting in the audience, you ought to be looking up a horn um, of a loudspeaker system or at least be you know, within a few dBs of on-axis. Um, and sadly, that's not so these days. Um, there's been a, a tendency to concentrate on the vertical directivity um, and, and kind of ignore the fact that the horizontal directivity cannot be the same for all the 
all the listeners, anybody off axis, off the center axis, horizontally, is going to be in a, a lower directivity index situation. Sometimes when we talk about um, intelligibility and the audibility of direct and reverberation situations, we sometimes talk, talk about critical distance. We talk about a distance that you can go into the room um, uh, where there's a certain distance where the reverberant characteristic of the room starts to overtake the direct sound. And once, you, once your direct sound sinks below the reverberation, the further you get away, um, the lower the speech intelligibility is going to be. Um, so mm. there's, a, there's a, a kind of calculation there that a lot of people do to work out critical distance. And you can see that it depends on Q. Um, another way of looking at it is it depends on directivity index. So again, um, people off axis of the loudspeaker system, if they've only got one system pointing per side, people that are unlucky enough to be sitting around the sides are going to be, will have a much shorter critical distance than people sitting on axis at the front. So um, again, talking about maximum intelligibility uh, really wants to have, you, you want to have maximum uh, direct sound compared with the reverb, which means you want to be as near as you can on axis of something in the system. Um, if you're not, and you're in a situation where you're listening to speech modulation and the lower parts of the speech modulation where the amplitude is lower, this is showing just one frequency, um, one formant frequency, um, you get interference with that envelope. If you think of this black line here as the envelope of the speech, you get interference where basically the previous syllables that are still reverberating around the room fill in that gap so the modulation depth becomes less. And the, more, the, the less that modulation depth is, the more difficult it is to hear one syllable from another. And it all becomes a bit of a blur eventually. Um, and I've said there, reverberation, is it friend or foe? Well, obviously, if you're listening to symphony orchestra um, or opera, then the reverberant tail, if it's a nice, clean spectrum reverberant tail, adds air to the, to the music. It allows the musicians to hear themselves coming back from the room. Uh, so it gives a, a kind of acoustical fallback. And it also allows voices to soar. Um, good opera singers can kind of sing along with their own reverberant energy coming back from the room. So it can actually enhance the performance. Um, the main thing is that the original signal needs to be strong and robust. So if you get somebody like Plasto Domingo singing in a reverberant space, because his voice is strong and clear, um, then you hear beautiful sound of direct sound plus the reverberant characteristic of the room. Whereas if I were to try and sing opera in, in a kind of opera house, um, my voice would not be anywhere near as strong as his, and so my voice would be much more prone to be buried within the reverb very quickly because my articulation would not be as good. Um, the other thing it um, suggests is that if we're putting a PA system into a room for speech intelligibility, particularly for safety reasons, then the speech from the loudspeaker needs to be strong and robust. Um, and one of the things that I'll talk about later on is the fact that um, a lot of loudspeaker systems aren't like that. A lot of loudspeaker systems suffer quite bizarre phase responses at mid and high frequencies, which means that they start off with a disadvantage straight away before that's buried in the room. One of the things you can do, if you're ever in a, in a, a large reverberant space, um, try playing an uncompressed music track and listening to the vocals, and then try playing an MP3 compressed version of the same track, and you'll find that the, the compressed version, while it might sound very similar on uh, earbuds or headphones, will sound disastrously muddled in the room because it's not such a strong and robust signal in the first place. It's had a lot of information stripped out of it, which you can get away with it on earbuds, but you won't get away with it in a reverberant space. It becomes much more prone to problems. So you need either a strong voice if it's an acoustical performance, or you need a strong, solid loudspeaker reproduction 
and you need most of the audience to be on axis of something. Um, and that's sadly rarely the case, really. I'm just going to quickly run through a little bit about how we can assess things for that, um, both how we can assess the loudspeaker system and also how we can assess the room. Um, the old-fashioned method of assessing a room would be to take an omnidirectional source, maybe pop a balloon or some kind of static device or fire a starting pistol, and then measure the reverberant characteristics of the room. And that would give you, even on an oscilloscope, you could pretty much see, if you had a log amplifier, you could see a room impulse response there and the decay. Um, the problem with that method is it doesn't tell you anything about the directivity of a, of a, of a real source. And remember that in modern entertainment complexes, 80% of the vocals you hear will be through some kind of loudspeaker system. So it's important to judge the loudspeaker system. And um, if the loudspeaker system doesn't have a good impulse response, isn't broadband and phase coherent, then the initial signal won't start off strong and robust, and it'll be more easily interfered with in the room. Um, one of the things you can find, if you look up somebody called Griesinger um, on Google, you'll find a recording of a voice that was done uh, just with a standard microphone in a, in a fairly dry room. And then he takes the harmonics, the, the harmonics of the voice above 1K and scrambles them. And it sounds like the second voice is already in a reverberant space. It becomes much more, um, much more easily affected by more reverberation in a bigger room. Um, you can actually do single channel um, analysis of the room with something like SMART, which is something that I teach. Um, but we tend to use it more for looking at acoustical phenomena like flutter echoes and things like that, rather than looking at um, speech intelligibility. Uh, we use a dual channel method of speech intelligibility so we can feed the loudspeaker with a known level of signal um, either with periodic noise or noise that's been voice shaped so that it more represents the spectrum and the power handling um, situation that the speaker's going to be in and when it's being used. If you just put an impulse through the loudspeaker, most loudspeakers you'll probably overload the, the high frequency section. Um, it'll be very, very difficult also to work out what an impulse is in terms of SPL for speech. So it's easier if you can emulate speech, really. Um, this is a, an example with a single system. It's not a useless technique. It can be used for things like flutter echoes. This is something I looked at in a, in a um, venue down near the south coast um, that has a really nice sound to it, has a really nice acoustic. Um, but when they've tried to record in there, they found that when the audience applause um, happens, that the applause sounds really strange and electronic. And it turned out that there were parallel walls either side of the main uh, bleacher audience uh, that was causing this kind of flutter echo. And what I found is just by uh, measuring with a hand clap and looking at the flutters here that were kind of fairly equally spaced, you'll notice that not only are they equally spaced, but each one has its own little reverb tail, um, which is kind of interesting. So the, the general nice reverb in the room is also being triggered off by the flutter echo from the audience. Um, and it sounded very strange, but uh, it's just a case of not putting absorbency in the room, but putting some diffusion in the either side of the audience, to not to kill the room, but to kill the flutter echo, is to smear it in time. If we do a more traditional room measurement, then we can look at things like propagation delay from a loudspeaker. We can look at early reflections. We can look at things like the early decay time and the RT60 and obviously um, various other things. Um, if we dig into the data, once you've got good impulse response data on a loudspeaker system in a room, then you can start assessing things like speaker intelligibility. Uh, you can assess uh, clarity and warmth and all those other parameters that are normally the kind of area that acousticians work in, um, which um, are important if you're going to do a fixed installation, particularly if a lot of the announcements during a live show are going to come through the PA and not through the voice evaxis system. <laughs>
Um, this is one of the things I was talking about with uh, traditional room assessments. When you traditionally measure reverb time in a room, you measure the peak impulse, and then you look at the, the reverberant tail. Um, and that peak impulse, to dig down into the reverberant tail, you need to have a logarithmic amplitude response, a logarithmic magnitude scale uh, on the vertical scale. And as soon as you switch your impulse to log, then you lose the phase information in it. So a lot of traditional reverberant characteristics of rooms that are measured by traditional methods don't tell you anything about the phase of the source, even if they're measuring the PA loudspeaker as the source, which in reality is probably unlikely. Um, if you look at standards for measuring room reverb um, and room impulse response, most of the standards categorically state that the source must be omnidirectional. And yet when we're in an audience situation listening to a loudspeaker system, uh, most of the time we're listening to a loudspeaker that's directional. So um, it's kind of a situation where the industry has got now where you've got sound system people and you've got an ac acousticians and there's no real crossover to do a kind of holistic approach of the assessment of the installation to make sure that it works on all fronts. If you, you can have two rooms with identical uh, speech intelligibility figures, STI, speech transmission indexes, where one will sound perfectly fine and the other one will sound terrible because the source hasn't been quantified. So they haven't looked at the phase response of the source. If the source phase response is all over the shop at mid and high frequencies, particularly if there's a whacking great crossover in the way, um, then what you end up with is something that's scrambled before it even gets launched into the reverberant space. And it doesn't take much weakness in the original sound to allow it to get lost in the reverberant space. It takes very little. Um, just keeping an eye on the time. Fourier analysis is what I tend to use for room reverberant characteristic characterizing. And I use the same technique, uh, but with different parameters for measuring loudspeakers. So um, if we look at Fourier analysis, Fourier analysis allows us to take a sample of waveform, either from a loudspeaker measurement or from a, a room um, field measurement, and see what frequency uh, characteristics uh, make up that waveform, to see what the frequency content is and what the amplitude of each harmonic is. We can take that further. We can, we can use a reference signal, which is typically the signal going to the loudspeaker system that we're going to be testing. Um, and we can use a microphone to measure the loudspeaker system. Um, Fourier transform transforms the waveforms into individual spectra. And by a little bit of um, analysis to see what the time difference is between these two spectra, the measurement spectra and the reference spectra, you can actually work out um, the time difference and add that into, um, in other words, delay the reference so that the two arrive at the same time. Once they arrive at the same time, then you can do a transfer function um, using the two um, spectra and see what the difference is. And you can look at the normal thing, which is amplitude response, amplitude versus frequency. You can look phase difference versus frequency. Um, there's even a, a function in there which is coherence, which, which tells you how related the two signals are. Um, just as a quick aside, um, you can kind of reverse that process. Um, if you take a waveform and analyze it and work out what its frequency components are, um, if you produce lots of different frequency components in unison, you can actually create the sound of a different waveform. So you could take a lot of organ pipes in this case um, in a particular amplitude ratio and a particular timing to, in this case, emulate the sound of strings. So as a kind of, you know, if you like, a kind of 17th century or 18th century, or in this case, 20th century um, synthesizer. But going back to sp spectral analysis and then using the two spectra, the reference and measurement, we can look at amplitude and phase, 
And the phase performance of the loudspeaker is really, really important in terms of, um, in terms of how it's going to perform in a reverberant space. One of the nice things about Fourier analysis is that you can take a transfer function like that, which has, a, has all the information about amplitude versus frequency and phase versus frequency, and you can do what's known as an inverse Fourier transform, and you can look at the impulse response of the loudspeaker. So by doing the inverse Fourier transform of the transfer function, you get the impulse response of the loudspeaker. So you can see how clean the impulse response is. You'll also be able to see on a linear scale um, whether there's any echoes or reflections actually in the loudspeaker system. I've measured quite a few loudspeaker systems where the, um, the mid and high frequency sections look amazing in prototype form. Then when the thing goes into production, you see this kind of mush going on, um, which turns out to be the grill. Um, and you start getting little uh, reverberant spaces going on between the grill and the, and the horn. Um, so um, that's clearly a picture of a loudspeaker with a, a, a near echo, a near reflection. Um, and obviously, as most of you probably know, if you get a, a reflection, in this case, off a sidewall or off the floor, then the direct sound will have a particular phase characteristic and the reflected sound will be phase delayed. Um, and it will be delayed by so many, um, so many degrees per hertz depending on the difference in distance. Um, and what that will produce is a kind of comb filtering effect. Now, there's nothing particularly bad about comb filters, and I know that people that measure with single microphones, and I think probably one of John's contentions about people measuring things badly, is you measure things and say, oh, it's terrible, it's got comb filtering. In actual fact, most of us listen to comb filtering all the time when we're walking around having conversations near walls, and we don't actually become aware of it. The only thing that the comb filtering will do, particularly with really bad early reflections, is um, cut down some of the detail in the original sound so that the sound kind of subtleties are lost. But as far as speech is concerned, um, it's fine if you're near somebody and you hear combing from a tabletop or from a sidewall. It's when you then propagate that into a reverberant space, it becomes a weak signal and uh, causes problems. Um, taking this just one step further, um, if we then look at our impulse response uh, on a logarithmic amplitude scale, then we can dig down into the reverberant measurement at that particular microphone position. So we start to see some room characteristic there, which is normally kind of buried away right on the center line of the impulse response. So you can basically zoom into it. The disadvantage of doing this is you lose the phase response. So you have to measure the phase response first and make sure that loudspeaker system's clean and you haven't got multiple speakers interacting too badly um, and you haven't got speakers too close to sidewalls which are causing you problems um, or ceilings or whatever. Once you've got that measurement, then just a reminder of what we're looking at, you can do a dual channel measurement of a loudspeaker system, which means if you use that dual channel process that you used for measuring the speaker, um, but you expand the, the sample to be several seconds, then you can analyze the room reverberation characteristic completely down to minus 60 or whatever level you want to measure it down to. Um, that's using Smart 7.5, which I use, which can be used as a standalone unit. In fact, you don't even have to do multiple measurements um, per microphone position. You can use um, Smart's own kind of periodic generator, which um, is matched to the analyzer um, so that you can do very quick measurements. Or you can use an external source and do averages. Um, in this case, you could have a signal source coming from something like a mixing console or speech or music. But m we tend to use noise because it's more predictable and quantifiable. Um, and once you've got that data, you've got all that dual channel FFT data and the IFT data 
then you can look at linear responses at the top here. You can look at the log response, which is the decay time, or you can translate that log response into a spectrograph where you can look at... Um, some people will probably be used to looking at that as a water, waterfall-type plot, where you can see decay per frequency over time. One of the things you can also do is look at the amplitude uh, versus frequency content of a sample of the time record. So you can look at the time, as long as you've got a long enough time period to resolve down to low frequencies, you can look at the amplitude of, say, a reflection compared with the direct sound or something like that. Um, there's an example here, um, and I'll just quickly go through this and then we'll move on. There's, um, I was involved in some work, this is actually for the BBC, um, where some musicians were complaining that they could hear certain notes that they were playing jumping back at them. Um, and the conductor that, who was on a rostrum, who was quite high up in the air, couldn't hear this problem and said it's f he couldn't hear it. But he was probably about a metre higher than normal standing height. And the BBC, who were recording the orchestra, had microphones just above touching height and they weren't picking it up in the truck either. So it was something that only the musicians down on the low stage could hear. And I suspected that it was reflections coming off some uh, uh, terraced step edges that allowed the musicians to be at different heights above the stage. So people that were on the downstage area were getting reflections from these. So we tested it. That's what I suspected was happening. And if you look at that, Obviously, for safety reasons, each terrace or each step is the same width. Um, and the problem with that is that if you get reflections off those edges, then the reflections coming back will be spaced at equal spacing, and then you'll get tuning at certain frequencies, and that's what I suspected was happening. So we took a bunch of loudspeakers on top of some subwoofers on dollies and moved them around the stage to these various positions and measured them at the worst-case positions for the musicians. And this is what we came up with in the linear time response. You see that those reflections are very equally spaced, which to most people that know anything about N-fired arrays will know that that's a perfect um, recipe for very strong summation at certain frequencies. That was the frequency content of just one position. And you'll see the, the general fold back around the stage, which is the upstage wall there, which is about 60 dB, and then this point here, which is just below 200 hertz, is about 16 dB. So there's about a 10 dB boost at certain notes. There's another one up here, but for some odd reason, the musicians didn't complain about that. And I think it was just low enough um, that it wasn't causing a problem. And it was masked by the other. So that's what was, um, that was the final measurements over multiple um, positions. And you see there's a very strong tendency there. I sent the report to the BBC with a piano keyboard because it was going to the music department. It wasn't going to their technical department. And obviously the solution there would not be to put carpets or something on those terraces. It would be to add some diffusion, like some binary amplitude diffusion or something like that on there, um, just to diffuse those edges. If we want to have a look at speech intelligibility, then what we can do is... I won't go into the great details here, but... We can put a Schroeder curve on there, which is a way of um, cleaning up the decay curve so that we can determine where the decay curve meets the noise floor in the room or the, in our measurement in reality. Um, and then we can put markers on the original direct signal, uh, 10 dB down, and we can use that to measure the early decay time. We measure it for the first 10 dB, multiply it by 6 for the 60 dB, and that becomes our early decay time. And we can do the same thing, uh, maybe from 5 dB below that down to as far down as we can get, as near as we can to 60 dB to get the RT60. And that, as soon as you do that on, on something like Smart, it'll immediately give you the, the figures at that particular seat position. Um, you can dig into those figures because you've got the impulse response of the loudspeaker in the room for multiple positions, uh, for each position, you can work out the 
reverberant characteristics per octave and per third octave. You can also look at things like early decay, time, direct reverb, uh, clarity, which is early to late decay ratios, um, and things like that. Uh, clarity's interesting one because clarity doesn't necessarily mean intelligibility. It's just the ability to hear the, uh, the, the early arrival compared with the late arrival, so the late arrival's not buried. It has more to do with listener fatigue in reality than it does intelligibility. But you find that if people get tired of listening to something, um, then they switch off. And when people switch off, then they m miss important announcements, particularly safety announcements. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we can do, including base ratio, which is not sub-base as we think of it in sound systems, but we're talking about base as in base instruments, where we're comparing octaves around 125 and 250 with octaves around 501k to see whether the reverberant characteristic and the characteristic of the room uh, may be clean, but is it warm? Is it, is it producing a natural sounding um, acoustic for musical productions? Um, and there are different ways of measuring the intelligibility. I've just shown three there. The current favored method is STI, speech transmission index, which looks at all of these octaves from 125 up to 8K, although in some countries they only do up to four, um, at all these different modulation uh, frequencies from, uh, this is like from slow speakers to fast speakers, if you like. Um, so um, that's the full set. And with a modern computer, even the cheapest tablet that you can buy at PC World will probably calculate those in a less than a second now. Um, in the early days when computers are really low performance and there wasn't much memory space, um, there was a very popular thing called STIPA, which is a speech transmission index for PA, which only measured things at spot frequencies and spot modulations. Um, so it's a much more sparse. And then there was, before that was RASTI, which is rapid uh, speech transmission index, which was even more sparse measurements. In fact, we used to pride ourselves in getting through RASTI tests with half the half the uh, drivers switched off on the PA system because we knew they were just going to test it at 500 hertz and 2K. Um, you can't get away with that now with that full STI. So that's it. Um, I'm going to hand over to John now who will talk a little bit about um, loudspeaker systems in practice, particularly for touring systems rather than fixed installations. Okay. It's all yours. Follow that. <laughs> um, I had about 200 things to say while Jim was talking, but of course I've forgotten them all now. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you a few pictures. Some of you may have seen some of these pictures before, but J so Jim talked to, uh, about measuring RT 60s and reverb and, and, and the fact that a lot of these measurements actually don't have anything to do with what the speaker is, which seems to me to be completely bonkers. Um, and, uh, and the fact that a, a reverb measurement is taken, say, with an omnidirectional speaker, and then, um, and then a speaker can be put into a room that might be very wide, too narrow, um, could be pointed badly, so it might be hitting a wall, giving you a strong reflection, uh, could have too much vertical dispersion, so it's shooting over everyone's head, um, so you're getting more reverberant than, a, than direct sound. So what are the practical aspects of all this and, and, uh, and how might they apply to um, how you design a speaker or how you choose a speaker? to do a job and um, and what choices you might have on a daily basis if you're doing shows. Um, now, you know, the, one of the first sound systems ever made um, for playing music was a phonograph and, uh, you know, the needle on record, 
nice big horn coming out, you know, his master's voice. That is a horn. It's a horn loudspeaker, has no electricity involved at all, clockwork motor to run it. Um, it's, it was the first sound system, really, um, for playing records. And, and it's a horn. So from a tiny, tiny um, signal, the tiny movement of the needle on the record, you're getting a lot of sound. Um, and so in the beginning, before we had amplifiers, and then when we did have amplifiers, they were very small, a few watts each, um, horns were absolutely crucial. Um, so here's a, here's a, a Voigt um, horn, corner horn speaker. Um, it, has a, uh, it has a driver coming up into this, this lovely uh, high frequency horn here. It's also got a vent underneath that, that allows the bass to come out. Um, 1930s stuff. Um, Voice of the Theatre, Altec. Um, some fantastic horns designed by Altec Company. Um, the, this is a multi-cell horn on the top, which as Jim was saying earlier, you know, it, a multi-cell horn by directing the sound out into, uh, into different parts of the audience gives a much more even sound. Everyone's looking down a cell. Um, multiple horns can give you that effect too. Um, building the system from multiple horns allows... Um, you know, uh, so one of the things about the... I feel like I've got a lot to cram into a very short time now. So one of the things about the two speaker, the two arrays, we won't call them line arrays, sometimes they're line arrays, sometimes they're columns, but the two speaker thing where they're facing straight out from the stage is when you're in the middle, you hear both. As you move towards one side, you come more on axis to that one and more off axis of this one and the image collapses almost immediately to the speaker, you know, on your side of the room. So you guys over there would tend to only hear this speaker. Um, with a multiple horn system, uh, say you've got two horns each side, or in this case where we've got them very far apart and they're angled in, um, as you move, you go more on axis of this one and more off axis of that one. Um, so you can, you, you can have a... Uh, you stand much more chance of getting a stereo image of, con of the stereo covering more of the room. Very, very important, that. Uh, 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 two line array, a, a line array hang each side of the stage facing straight ahead will give almost no stereo um, for most people unless they're dead in the middle. And in fact, if I'm mixing on one, I can literally step like that and the image will go over there and here it's back. And because those two, uh, because the two vertical sources are so coherent, um, you get comb filtering between the two arrays. So I can move from one end of the mixer to the other and here maybe six or eight dB less at 250 hertz, depending where I'm standing at the mixer. There's so much cancellation between those two very, very coherent low mid sources. So. Um, yeah, multiple horns and horns directed into the audience. Sound systems started with cinema. That's where they really they needed them. They needed to play these movies. And uh, so all the original development of sound systems, JBL, uh, James B. Lansing, uh, Altec, they, they all, um, RCA, they all uh, developed their stuff for the cinema. Look, it's really interesting um, double horn system here. There's one, one for upstairs, one for downstairs. And the, and the two can swivel. So, you know, sound systems, um, this is another thing about that array thing where it's the same dispersion all the way down. Um, a sound system, if I'm over here on this side of the room and I want to hit this room, I need, about, I need about 60 degrees up there and down here I need about 90 degrees. But it's not 60 and 90, it's 60 and 90. So designing a sound system to suit a room uh, a lot of rooms like this, theatres, which, which have side walls as opposed to a field, an open field, um, you need an asymmetric system. You don't want a system that's just a fixed dispersion. You need a system that's got, is narrow up the back and then as it comes down it twists. So um, here's, a, here's a, a nice little um, phase coherent speaker design, louder, um, a louder driver. There's a guy making these now. Uh, copies 
reproductions of these really good ones. Um, met him at Frankfurt. Um, full range speaker in, in, a, in a five inch cone. Um, so horns, this is the turbo sound bass bin pattern. Um, Jim's talking about putting a speaker in the corner of a room. I mean, that's, that's kind of what you're doing with a, with a horn loaded bass bin. Bass bin is you, um, you can see the speaker there, it's pointing into the corner of the room and it's closed off and it's coming back around. That's how, how that first came about. Um, multiple horn system, this one's just stacked up in the, uh, in, in the warehouse there, 1972. Back then we didn't know how to make systems bigger. Um, you know, we were literally stacking stuff up and the whole idea of arraying hadn't really come about yet. You've got some vertical arrays there, but if that system was stacked like that on a stage, which they often were, um, then uh, you could get some really serious beaming up the middle of those double columns of high frequency horns. And of course, early, um, these, uh, you know, like a, a trumpet is made for maximum efficiency. It's, uh, uh, what's the word? What's the word? Flair? <laughs> it, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> exponential, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> exponential maximum efficiency flare. Um, they, their directivity wasn't that good on them and you got most of the higher frequencies went up the middle and then as they went down in frequency they got wider. So a um, little bit later on, uh, CD horns came along. So this is, this is um, 1980, this is a turbo sound festival system. Um, uh, you can kind of see, if you go like that on the side, you can kind of see a very narrow dispersion line array uh, of mid-range there. Lots of HF, we had a point source HF cluster in the middle. Um, the, uh, the stage was obviously too tall at that gig for us to get all our base bins on uh, before putting the mid-range on top, so we stacked the base above the mids. Um, this was us getting into actually arraying loudspeakers. There's a lot of loudspeakers in there and there were an awful lot of amplifiers driving it. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of dozen amp racks. Obviously that sort of system now would run off two or three amp racks and uh, all the amplifiers in there were only about 300 watts each. So Trunks and trunks of XLR cable for speaker lead. But we're talking arrays now. We're talking, this is, this is, uh, this is where as Jim said, wherever you are in the audience, you're looking down a horn. And these were very narrow. These early turbos were only a few degrees of dispersion. Um, going right through, uh, I just saw Doug earlier. I don't know if he's, if he's actually still here. Doug Hall was on this gig. This was the Monsters of Rock. This is kind of where um, the arraying of large speaker boxes reached a bit of a uh, peak here. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we had 300 TMS-3s, each of which had two 15-inch, two 10s, and one or two HF drivers in. And uh, polarity checking that lot was not, not funny. Tony actually did it. Um, but we realised at that point that you, know, you were on a law of diminishing returns. You couldn't actually you couldn't actually get that many speakers to sing out the same hymn book, really. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to pull out of this one, and uh, I'm just going to go a little bit more recent. So I I, I toured with this band Underworld, which uh, um, it's dance music, uh, and it and it sort of bangs along quite loud, and um, so they, they've got a new agent and they wanted to go and play new places and they wanted to, they, they were doing their, um, a recreation of their, of their Dub No Bass With No Head, My Head Man album. And uh, so they handed, handed us out the list of gigs and said, what do you think of this lot? This is, what we, this is where we're going to play on this tour. There was a month of shows and nearly all of them were either concert halls or used to be churches. They were the worst you know, some of the worst uh, sounding reverberant, m or most reverberant, not the worst sounding, but the most reverberant venues that most of us had played for, you know, since we had no choice. And now we've got choice and we're doing them anyway. So 
these have actually come up in uh, alphabetical order, not in order of... Because um, they're in a folder, aren't they? Um, so the Paradiso in Amsterdam, this, this as you can see, was a, it was a church, and, um, and it's, it's really clean inside. There's not much in the way of absorption at all. And what we found, we took Resolution 5s on this, uh, on this tour, um, and what we found was that with these highly reverberant spaces, if you could keep the sound off the walls... I mean, I have, done, I have done tours where we've taken bags of drapes and market clips and we've draped and, you know, really made, made big efforts. There wasn't a lot of opportunity in these places to hang drapes. It's easy if you're going into... Um, I would say if you're going to do a tour of um, university gymnasiums, then take two big bags of drapes and lots of clips and some rope and drape the back of the room, you know, just make a massive difference to your gig every day. Um, and we would, we've done that. We've gone into places like UEA and hung a big drape and done a show and the local crew have gone, that, was, that sounded great. Why did it sound so good? And we're, well, you know, big load of black stuff at the back. Really helps. So we were going in with, with a Resolution 5. is a 20-degree dispersion box. It's pretty narrow this way, about 12, 15 degrees vertical. 20 degrees, and you can literally build your system to hit the people and not the walls. Um, so th this is a... I was, particularly, I was particularly proud of this one. So we've got... Um, we, walked in, we went in the Paradiso, and they put an extra balcony in since I was last there, so, uh, which was a bit previous of them. So there's another balcony up here. We've actually got a speaker on a pole in the corner up there. So we've got a little system for this area and a little system for this area. And they're not running that loud. Um, now, the front of the floor down here is sunk down. So we've got an infill here. And then for the main part of the floor, we've got four res fives. And then this is what really threw me, is that normally I'd put a row on top here for the back of the room and possibly catch the balcony as well, but I couldn't because the, the balcony was overhanging where the sound system was. And if I took a, if I took a base bin out, I didn't have enough base bins. So I got three, three bins aside there. So I put... I, these are downfills. So I put this little system up here for the balcony and the back of the floor. So I've got downfill boxes there, which are doing from about it kind of where I am and backwards, which was raised up again. So it wasn't getting hit by these. These were going underneath. So it's a complicated system. And, and it took walking in there in the morning and looking at the room and thinking, oh dear, it's not how I remember it. Uh, didn't have all these levels before. It was basically just a flat floor and a balcony. So there's lots going on. What we did do, though, was uh, it had to be right because we'd made them take their system out, you know, and they don't like it, do they? Um, so it did have, a, it did have a two big black things in there, which they'd only just bought. Um, so, so we made them take it out. But the good news was that a friend of mine just went there last weekend and they're still talking about this gig. So we did a nice job. Um, there's a view from upstairs, you're looking down a horn. With these, with these axe head mid-range, if you're looking down that thing and you can see some comb, you've got good mid-range. Um, I don't know if you, if you know, but with function one, it's the mid that really does the sound. It's a comb drive mid-range that goes way up, up to six kilohertz, seven kilohertz. We're, we're getting sound from that mid-range. And the tweeter just is a tweeter. It's just a constant directivity horn with a compression driver on. So highly reverberant space. Um, here's, here's another one. This is a... Um, that is the Ancien Belgique. Not so reverberant, uh, but lots of wood. bit clangy, this one. bit kind of... It's got one of those flutter things. The, um, uh, these wooden balustrades down the side are completely... They're on three levels and they're completely parallel down the side. So you've got this clackety clack thing, and uh, uh, it can sound a bit. Um, can sound a bit like this. Oh, I did that. Can sound a bit like this. <laughs> 
when you're out in the room. So if you can keep the sound off those wooden panels and on the people. The other thing as well, just while I'm there, is I quite often do a bit of EQ in the sound check or before sound check. I might, I might run smart on a dual channel and I'll look at what the, what, the, uh, what the room's doing to my system and I might pull some EQ, might pull some big, big chunks of EQ sometimes, depending on what the room sounds like. The thing to do is always remember, for God's sake, when the people come in, put it back. Otherwise, it sounds so thin. That floor reflection that, that Jim mentioned, you know, you can be front of house and get a massive honking suck out and a bump at 200, 250 and EQ it like mad. You'll never fix it. But if you, if you don't put that back in when the people come in the room, you'll have a huge hole in your low mid. And all the warmth and the, you know, the music's in the mid range, isn't it? The music's not in the, the, the low frequency and the tweeters. That's rhythm. There's boof and tss. But the music is, is in it the is mid in range. Hmm? It is in reggae. It, 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 is, <laughs> it is a bit. It is a bit in reggae. You've still got chanka chanka, haven't you, in the middle? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. All right. So, um, sound system to, to fit the room. Much more simple. Uh, but again, we've got, uh, a row of, we've got a row of horns. Row of horns for the balcony. Row of horns for the back of the floor. Row of, row of um, downfills for this area. And an infill. And quite often... Um, you know, the, the people down the front, there's a lot talked about these days about, um, you know, having the same level all the way from the front to the back. And, and if you've ever been to uh, uh, and listened to a sound system that's set up like that, um, it's really bizarre because it really feels so much louder down the, um, at the back than it does at the front. Uh, you measure it, it's the same all the way back down the venue, but it's because we're used to hearing it louder at the front and of course at the back when the reverberation is added back in it makes it feel even louder so it's it's very odd and I think that people that don't want it too loud go up the back of the venue and people that really want it loud go down the front so why you know what's wrong with that I don't see what's wrong with that um, th this it's quite a good one um, Almost, a, almost an outdoor event, you know, a big open warehousey kind of space. This is the Phillips building in Eindhoven. Um, on this side of the room, there's a, there's a balcony and it runs down the side and round the back. On this side of the room, it's uh, ducting. And, uh, and the last thing you want to be doing is aiming speakers at ducting. We have speakers aimed at ducting, but we just unplugged them. So we put them in to make the array so we could hang the ones below and we unplug the ones we don't need and we don't get a load of sound going where we don't want it to go. I think there's a... There you go. There's a picture from the balcony on the side. Um, so we're right up on the balcony. Up on there's a riser at the back of the balcony and I'm looking down a horn. There's another, another um, one of those wooden concert halls that are made for choirs and orchestras. We've done a we've done a, a, a fill down here for the for the mosh pit, the dancers that really want it banging down the front, and then we've got the system up here. You can see it almost looks like it's aimed outwards. That's because it that's because it kind of is slightly, but there's side balconies going all the way around. We can aim the speakers where we want the sound to go. Aim the speakers where we want the sound to go. <laughs> there's a view from behind the speaker. This is in the Sage in Gateshead. This is actually, the seating goes down and then there is a proper drop into a pit, the front, for standing up dancing area. Hammersmith Odeon. Just that made, for, made for it. Fan-shaped building, fan-shaped array, just fits. One of the only places that you can go and do a gig where your array actually needs to be symmetrical. Little symmetrical array, but angled in. Um, that's in Cologne. And uh, oh, last one, Manchester Albert Hall. One of the rattliest venues I've ever been in. Um, kept the system nice and low, which stacking it. See, they've left their they've left their um, speakers in there. Pulled them up out the way. Um, we hit. Most of the venue with 
the two stacks. We're getting underneath the balcony there, underneath all the way to the back downstairs with these. Um, we've got a couple of little speaker fills, actually not on the stage yet, but we had a couple of little fills for just down the front there. Um, and we've got one speaker up here for this area, which we can't hit from the stack. Worked very nice. There's a, there's a picture of a uh, chap there angling the speakers to uh, suit the room. I think I've had it for time, haven't I? You're going to have to cut it short there. Um, but if anybody has any questions for John or Jim, um, they'll be kicking around uh, here, or you can go over to the Function One stand, or yeah, they'll be kicking around. Do find them and ask your we'll questions. We'll be having a kick about out, <laughs> out the front. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.